We often train each muscle group with multiple exercises in our training routines, but how many exercises should we train each muscle with? And when selecting different exercise variants, which should we combine in a training program to maximize muscle growth? In this video, we will attempt to answer these questions. This topic is mostly dictated by the anatomy of each muscle. Each muscle has a unique anatomical structure, which will determine what movements require it to actively contract. While we can't cover the anatomy of every muscle in this video, let's go through a few quick examples to understand the basics of muscle contraction. First, let's look at a simple muscle like the biceps. The biceps originate at two different points on the scapula and insert onto the bones of the forearm. The fibers of the biceps all run in essentially the same direction, meaning they all pretty much perform the same functions. This is primarily going to be elbow flexion, meaning bending the elbow like we see during a bicep curl. Another slightly more complex muscle is the pec major. This muscle has multiple origin sites. The upper fibers attach on the clavicle, the middle fibers attach on the sternum, and the lower fibers attach on the rib cage. Although they all insert at the same point on the humerus, which is the upper arm bone. This creates an almost fan-shaped muscle fiber structure, which has multiple functions such as flexion, horizontal flexion, and extension of the shoulder. And getting even more complex than the pec major, let's look at the entire back muscle group. The back consists of multiple muscles, primarily the lats, traps, rear delts, and spinal erectors. Without going into the anatomical details of each muscle, the back has many different muscle attachment sites and multiple muscle fiber orientation angles. These muscles collectively act to flex and horizontally flex the shoulder, retract, depress, and elevate the scapula, and to extend, laterally flex, and rotate the spine. As we can see, the back muscle group has many more functions compared with other simpler muscles. So based on the anatomy of each muscle, we can bias certain fibers of a muscle or bias specific muscles of a muscle group. For example, a flat and inclined bench press both train the pec muscles. However, we can bias the upper fibers of the pec by performing an incline press, and we can bias the middle pec fibers using a flat press. This is an example of biasing different fibers of the same muscle. Another example would be the back. Horizontal rows and vertical pulls both train the back muscles. Although horizontal rows usually bias the upper back muscles like the middle traps, rhomboids and rear delts, and vertical pulls are better to bias the lats and lower traps. This is an example of biasing different muscles within the same muscle group. However, this is less applicable to muscles with fewer functions. For example, we can train the biceps using any form of biceps curl. However, we can't really bias different fibers because all fibers pretty much have the same function. So all fibers will be trained using basically any curl variation. So depending on the particular muscle group, we may want to include more or less exercises to train that specific muscle. And we probably want to include movements which train all of the primary movement patterns that the muscle group produces. So we can be intentional with the exercises we select to make sure all fibers are maximally stimulated throughout the week. The next consideration relevant for this topic is what is known as the biarticular muscle theory. This theory suggests that biarticular muscles, which are muscles that primarily act on more than one joint, won't be maximally recruited if the muscle is involved in opposing actions. Let's break this down to make it more understandable. An example of this theory when it comes to lifting is the rectus femoris, the large middle quad muscle. The other three quad muscles originate on the femur, but the rectus femoris originates on the pelvis. And like the other quad muscles, it inserts on the tibia, which is one of the bones of the lower leg. So not only does it perform knee extension like the other quad muscles, it also performs hip flexion. So during any squat pattern, the knees extend, but the hips extend too. This means that the rectus femoris is shortening at the knee, but lengthening at the hip. Because it performs two opposing muscle actions, it isn't going to be maximally recruited and trained. So to maximize rectus femoris growth, we probably need to include an isolated knee extension exercise like the leg extension machine. The biarticular muscle theory also applies to other muscles such as the biceps during horizontal rows and vertical pulls, the long head of the triceps during any pressing movements, the hamstrings during squat patterns, and the gastrocnemius during squat patterns. Because of this, we may need to include more or less exercises to maximize growth of each muscle group. And we may need to implement different exercise variations to make sure we train each region of a muscle group. 
Next, let's discuss stretch-mediated hypertrophy. This is the emerging concept that the portion of an exercise when the muscle is stretched seems to be the most hypertrophic. And exercises which train a muscle in a more stretched position tend to be more hypertrophic. For example, this study compared triceps growth from overhead extensions versus pushdowns. Trainees performed overhead extensions with one arm and pushdowns with the other arm for 5 sets of 10 reps 2 times per week for 12 weeks. While both triceps saw significant growth, the long head of the triceps especially saw greater hypertrophy with the overhead extensions, shown in the blue, compared with the pushdowns, shown in the orange. This is likely because the overhead extensions train the long head of the triceps in a more stretched position. So what this suggests is that we probably want to try and hit each muscle in a fairly lengthened position at some point within our training routine. And we can select specific exercises to make sure we are hitting each muscle in a stretched position. The next consideration for this topic is the strength curve of each exercise. This refers to how difficult an exercise is at different portions throughout the range of motion, and how hard the muscle has to work at different portions of the movement. While two exercises may train the same muscle, certain exercises may have more or less tension at different portions of the movement. This means different exercises may stress the muscle more or less at different ranges of motion. So in theory, it may be beneficial to implement multiple exercises which train a muscle group with different strength curves. This could hypothetically result in preferential hypertrophy at different regions of the same muscle. And long term, we may see more uniform overall muscle development across the entire muscle belly. Although we don't have solid evidence supporting this claim, there is some evidence indicating this may be a viable strategy. For example, this study explored the effects of quad training with different exercises on regional muscle hypertrophy. Trainees performed 4 sets of 12 reps to failure with either leg extensions or Smith machine squats 3 times per week for 5 weeks. While both exercises were effective at promoting overall quad growth, regional hypertrophy was different between groups. Smith machine squats resulted in greater growth of the upper quad region, while leg extensions resulted in superior growth of the lower quad region. This gives us reason to believe that exercises with different strength curves may bias different regions of a muscle. The next consideration for combining exercises is how much of a hypertrophic stimulus a muscle receives via indirect training. This refers to muscles which are trained during a movement but aren't necessarily the target muscle of the exercise. Some muscles receive a significant stimulus via indirect training which may influence the number and type of exercises implemented. For example, this study explored muscle activation of the deltoid muscles during various different exercises. Eight resistance trained males performed a 10 rep max with nine different upper body exercises while deltoid muscle activity was recorded. It was found that the direct shoulder exercises tended to result in the greatest muscle activation. However, other indirect exercises still heavily involved the various heads of the delts. Here we can see that the shoulder press resulted in the greatest front delt activity, but chest exercises like the bench press and pec deck were not far behind. For the middle delts, the dumbbell lateral raise, cable lateral raise, and reverse pec deck were best, but the seated row was also quite effective. And for the rear delts, the reverse pec deck was best, but the lat pull down and seated row also had a quite high involvement. So in this case, the delts are probably going to get a pretty decent stimulus from indirect training alone. So muscles like the delts probably don't require as many exercises because they are already trained through various different movement patterns. Based on the factors discussed, let's now establish some practical guidelines for each muscle group. For the chest, we should include a flat incline and fly variation to maximize development. A decline variation may also be beneficial, but the lower chest fibers will usually be trained sufficiently via flat pressing exercises. As a minimum, we at least want to include a horizontal and vertical pull for the back. It may also be additionally beneficial to hit the back from various other angles too. For the quads, we want to implement a squat pattern and an isolated knee extension movement. For the hamstrings, we want to include both a hip hinge and an isolated leg curl. For the glutes, some sort of hip thrust or bridge, a squat pattern and a hip hinge pattern are recommended. However, the glutes are probably going to be trained significantly via quad and hamstring training, so you may not need to include too much direct volume here. 
To maximize delt growth, we want to include a shoulder flexion or horizontal flexion movement to train the front delts, a shoulder abduction exercise for the middle delts, and a shoulder extension or horizontal extension exercise to hit the rear delts. However, these muscles will be heavily trained via chest and back training, so it may not be necessary to perform too much direct volume here. For the biceps, any curl variation is probably sufficient, but including at least one of your exercises which train them in a stretched position is probably going to be beneficial. Similar to the biceps, any elbow extension variation is probably sufficient for the triceps, but ensure at least one of your exercises train them in a stretched position. For the calves, a standing calf raise variation is sufficient, but if you want to specifically bias the soleus, a seated variation may also be included. And lastly, the abs are going to be involved in almost all exercises you perform in the gym and don't usually require much or any direct training. However, to maximally develop them, we probably need to perform a trunk flexion movement, a trunk rotational movement, and a lateral flexion exercise. So these are some general guidelines to maximize the development of each muscle group. However, there is significant individual variation between each lifter in three primary ways. Most of this theory is based on general muscle anatomy, and we base most of our anatomy knowledge on models. This is certainly helpful, but anatomy models represent the average. In reality, there can be significant variation in anatomical structures like muscle insertions, pination angles, height, limb lengths, and the shape of our bone structures. For example, this study explored the anatomical variation of the pec major muscle in 40 cadavers. And as we can see in these four examples, the pec major muscles have significant enough variability to alter training recommendations. This person has very horizontally oriented upper pec fibers, while this person has more of a fan-shaped pec muscle. These differences in anatomy can be significant enough to influence which exercises are more or less effective at training certain muscles or certain regions of a muscle. Another way in which these recommendations should be individualized is via our personal preferences. This refers to which muscles we want to emphasize over others. This is based on what muscles are naturally more or less developed relative to the rest of your physique. For lagging muscles, or those you want to maximize development of, it is a good idea to ensure we are training the muscles in all primary movement patterns as listed earlier. This will ensure we are training all regions of the muscle and hitting it via all relevant movement patterns. This in theory would result in a faster rate of muscle growth. And for muscles you may not be currently trying to maximize growth of, you may not need to train these with all the movement categories mentioned. Instead, you might just want to include one or two movements for that muscle to save time and energy for other muscles you are preferencing at the current point in time. And this will likely result in a slower rate of growth. And the last form of individual variation relevant to this discussion is equipment availability. Not everyone has access to a fully equipped gym, which allows them to train each muscle in all of these movement patterns. So although in theory we want to try and hit each muscle with the recommended movement patterns, it is not always a viable option. And this is completely fine, you are still able to grow significant muscle mass over time, it just may not be the fastest rate of growth possible. In reality, most people don't have access to all the equipment they would like, and most people don't have endless amounts of time to dedicate to training. So we should all simply do our best with the current equipment we have access to and our current circumstances. Thanks for watching and hopefully you got something out of this video. Check out flowhighperformance.com for online coaching, training templates, ebooks and more.